my name is Tommy, one of the pastors here, going to be sharing with you this morning. We are in the middle of a sermon series called The Seven, The Seven Letters uh, to These Seven Churches in the Book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open it up. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. But before we get there, I just want to play a little game because, hey, it's Tommy. Um, Every church, right, has some kind of sign. And today we're talking about a church called Sardis. It had a sign, but the question we're going to ask, was it alive or was it dead? So we'll play a little game here to get warmed up. Church signs, is it real or is it fake? You tell me. Here's the first one. Church sign says, come here, our pastor. He's not very good, but he's short. If you think that's real, it's really on a sign. Put your thumbs up. If you think it's fake, put that thumbs down. What do you think? Now, we're not talking about Pastor David's height, all right? No, no jokes. I didn't just say that out loud. All right, as the answer is, that's a real sign. That's a real sign. So that's really on a church sign. Here's another one. See if you can get this right. Real or fake? Prophecy class canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. What do you think, real or is it fake? <clears throat> well, answer is, that's real. Yeah, it, it really happened. I guess maybe a new teacher, I don't know. Uh, next sign, let's try this one. Our church is like brownies, sweet with a few nuts. Is that our church? That's, yeah, we can go for that one. That's actually out in the front yard, right? I'm kidding, it's not in the front yard. Answer is, no, that's fake. They wouldn't let the guy, they wouldn't let him put him up. He tried, but they wouldn't let him do it. How about this one? It says, life is cray-cray, Jesus is the way-way. What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, answer is, yeah, that really happened, people. That's what happens when you let high schoolers put up the church sign. How about this one? Having trouble sleeping? We have sermons. What do you think? Real or fake? Yeah, that's going to be real, people. It really happened. You can come hear one if you want, they say. How about this one? Whoever stole our AC units, keep one. It is hot where you are going. <laughs> what do you think? Real? Fake? Well, if you said real, you got it right. All right, a couple more. How about knock, knock? Who's there? Jesus. Jesus who? Exactly. What do you think? Real or fake? Yeah, that would be real. All right, last one. Now's a good time to visit our pastors on vacation. What do you think? Is that real or is that fake? People, that really happened. <laughs> that really happened. Now, our pastor is on vacation, but I didn't put those two together. It's okay. Hey, if you're here, we're glad you're here today. Hey, we've been walking through this sermon series again called Seven, these seven churches and these seven cities, and we're on number five today. So it's the letter to a church called Sardis. If you've got your Bible, open it up to Revelation chapter 3. Pretty easy. Go to the back of the Bible, last book there. Back up, find chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 as we talk about this church called Sardis. Now, it had a church sign, First Church of Sardis. Pretty sure that's what it was called, right? And it had the sign there, and it had activity, and it had a building, and it even had some people. But the question we'll look at it today, was it alive or was it dead? And so each of these letters, as we walk through these, we've got these four C's we've been kind of walking through with each church. First of all, we talk about the Christ. So that is Jesus, who is giving this message to the apostle named John, who's exiled, end of his life, on this island called Patmos. And he gets these letters, and they write them, and they circulate them to these churches. So the Christ is speaking to his church. This church, well, it's the church of Sardis. We're going to talk about where that is and what that looked like. And then he gave kind of each of them a message Something about change. Change your ways. You're doing great. You're not doing great. What was the message that he gave to each church? And then lastly, what does that have to do with the second coming? Do we need to change some things before Christ's return? Are we doing okay? So that's the outline, if you will, we're walking through with each of these letters. So let's start with just some slides here to get you kind of realizing what is Sardis? Where is it at? What's it look like? It's an actual real place. So here's a map. You can look at this map. Uh, I got this from Right Now Media. Uh, one of our ministry resources we use. So it's going to be in Turkey, as you know it today. If you've been to Greece or Turkey, you're right there in that area. But let me show you. These are the seven, if you will, churches and the seven cities that we've been going through. So today we're going to be talking about the city of Sardis right there in the Bible Times. It's called Asia Minor. Now you can see the roads that go through here, these important roads back in the day. One was called the King's Road. And Sardis sits right in the middle of all these intersections. So it was a very important city. Close to the coast, lots of trade, a lot of first things. Matter of fact, one of the first things that came out of there, Sardis, that you probably have in your pocket. Maybe. Anybody got any change in your pocket? Got a coin? 
If you have a coin, you realize that came from the city of Sardis. That's where the idea of coinage was originated. The king there, his name was Croesus. There's a saying called Riches Croesus, and their rivers were filled with gold. And so they had so much precious metal, they're the ones that began to stamp it and make these things called coins, and that's where it came from as rich as Croesus. Well, the city set up on a hill, and they thought that there's no way that this city on Sardis could be conquered. So if you'll back up one slide for me there, this is the first guy that came along and said, yeah, we're going to take this city. His name was Cyrus the Great. He's the king of the Persians. So the Persians are coming in, and they're going to sack this city. But the next slide kind of tells a story of what they have to do. So you can imagine their army is encamped down here in the valley. They're looking up on the hill of this city, and they're thinking, how are we going to get our army up there? I mean, if you know anything about battle, right, if you have the height advantage up here, you're in the elevation, you've got the advantage. You can throw stuff down. They're shooting it up. A lot easier to throw stuff down. And so the story goes, it's actually by Herodias, the historian, tells the story of how the Persians conquered the city. There was a soldier who was basically standing on the edge of the cliff, and he kind of looked over, and his helmet fell off. And it went clank, 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 and finally hit the bottom. So the Persian army's down here, and some of the soldiers see this thing bouncing down, and they see this soldier run down, get his helmet, and then he turns around, and he goes back up this windy little path of kind of hide-and-seek game and takes the right turns, climbs the right wall, and all they do is send some men to follow him. And as they follow him, they see kind of a secret path that led up the side of this cliff. They went back, they got some more soldiers, and those men followed that same path, they went up, and sure enough, it was very weakly defended. They took that part of the city. They began to burn the rest of it. The other soldiers marched up, and they sacked the whole city because some dude lost his helmet. That's from Herodias, the historian. True story. Now, it happened again about 300 years later with a guy named Antiochus the Great. This time, the, the Greeks came in, and this king, very similar story. I'll tell you at the end of the day of how they captured it, but same thing. One little weak spot. They discovered it, and they were able to take the city on a hill. Now, if you go there today, it looks like this. So these are actually photos of where Sardis was. It's up on top of those cliffs, up on that mountain. And in the valley, you see some remains of the cities that have been there over the years. So as you keep looking at a few of the pictures, you'll see what it was like. Imagine that city up there, and you have to get up those cliffs if you want to take this city. Now, you look down through the valley, there's still people that live there today, the vineyards, there's businesses, there's people that live in this area. Uh, if you go a couple more pictures, you'll see even the ruins of what was called the Temple of Artemis. Now, we talked about this a few of the other churches that worshiped this pagan god called Artemis. And with that, it wasn't just not worshiping the god. It's some sick and disgusting stuff that they were doing in the name of worship. Matter of fact, if you were to sketch out what that temple, this is what it would look like today. Down in that valley, that Temple of Artemis with this statue and the people would come and things like sacrifice of people, things like just inappropriate relationships with priests and all kinds of weirdness and things that are happening in the name of worship to this Artemis. So now that you got that picture in your mind, as we read this letter to this church, I don't want you to think just about Sardis. What would Jesus say to me? What is he saying to our church? What is he saying to us as individual believers? Are we awake or are we dead? There's a sign there that says, Tommy Hendricks, believer in Christ. Is it just a sign or am I actually alive in the name of Christ? So let's read Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to take the time we have left as we look at this scripture to this church and understand that, yes, you're writing specifically to that church at that time, but you're also writing to your church today. And that includes us as a church of body believers and as people. So, God, if anybody has ears, help us to hear what you wanted to say to us this morning. Thank you, Father. Put your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. All right, so let's take a look real quick. Sardis. You know where it is. We've seen some pictures. What was happening? How could a church go from being alive to dead? Well, let's take a look at the sins of Sardis. So if you read some history around it, uh, study the pagan worship of the Artemis God, what are some things that come along with that that must have been infiltrating, if you will, into that church? Well, things like materialism. Stuff matters. How much stuff can I get? The wealth, the coins in my pocket, right? It gets there. It's about appearance. Building looks fantastic. The sign is amazing. Our sign blinks. Do you see that? I mean, everything on this property, the church, it just looks great. But on the inside, it's hollow. It's dead. Things like they care about the reputation, what people think about the church. But if you go there, there's not much to be thankful for. It says they have fallen asleep. So at one time, they were known. He says, I know you. They were known in the area as being something special. Man, that first church of Sardis, that was something else back in the day. Man, when we grew up there, that was amazing. The reputation of that church, wow, everybody knows about it. But they had fallen into ritual rather than a relationship with God. And over time, when sin had crept in, it destroyed the church. And it was nothing just a place where people met, but there was no worship of the real God. It had died. So what about today? Does that happen today to churches Tallahassee, Florida, the U.S.? Do churches really die? What do you think? Let me show you some signs of a dead church. It lists some things that Sardis experienced. They had events, but they had no evangelism. We have a car show. It's great to have a car show. We have Adventure Week. We have 500 kids on this campus doing Adventure Week. It's amazing. You can have all the events in the world, but if there's no evangelism, there's no life change, there's no gospel, you're just putting on a show, right? Things like crowds, but no disciples. Man, there's lots of people here, but are there anybody discipling anyone else? Are we making disciples of Jesus Christ? Churches have traditions, but what about worship? Man, we have the Fourth Sunday in November, the pancake flipping contest. Every year, my grandpa won it back in 1948, and we're still flipping pancakes today. That's great to flip pancakes, but are you leading people to Christ through what the church is doing? See, you could describe it as it's shiny on the outside. It looks great. The church sign is still up and some cute, funny sayings maybe on the sign. But what about the inside of the church? Remember that prophet Samuel as he's anointing that second king of Israel, the little boy David? He's anointing him, and they think, no way that little guy can be the king, right? And he says, look, man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. God's not looking to see how the appearance of celebration is or a church today. He's looking to see what takes place when the people get together. It's not about the campus, right? This is just a building. The church is the people. So when the people come together, are they worshiping the one true God? I think about a church... One of the first experiences I had when I was in Ohio, uh, my first full-time church job, if you will, and a church down the road had an event. I was like, oh, i got to go check this thing out. It was a festival. I was into block parties and outreach events and seeing how people could use that to reach new people to come to church, right, to come to know Christ. Well, this was a Catholic church, and I'd only been to one or two Catholic churches in my life, and this was completely different than what I'd ever experienced. Now, I'm not picking on Catholic churches. I'm just saying this one church did this thing that I went to. They called it a festival. And it turned out this is how they raised their annual budget. They brought in carnivals and rides. They sold beer. You get all the alcohol you want for an unlimited you know, amount. Uh, they had gambling. You could buy tickets, raffles, all this stuff. And there were thousands, probably four or 5,000 people that came over the weekend to visit this festival. If you go back the next Sunday, there might be 80 people in the church. And I thought, now, now that's kind of strange. This church is known for this humongous event, but is that church known for changing the lives of people? 
Now, I'm not picking on one church. I'm saying let's talk about our church. Let's talk about where you grew up, your home churches. Let me show you just a chart real quick of kind of where we're at in the U.S. This first chart from Lifeway Research. This is a comparison chart with churches that are starting new plants, new churches, versus churches that are dying in the U.S. Now, these are Protestant churches. So when you see the top line, the blue there, in 2014, every five years, a study comes out. So they'll come out again in 2024. They're saying 4,000 churches opened. 4,000 new churches across the U.S. opened up. And how many closed? 3,700 closed the doors. Here's the keys. We're done. Sell the property. It's over. Now, we've been ahead of that curve for a long time. But in 2019, when it came out again, for the first time, if you will, that trend flipped. And now we are heading the other direction very rapidly. In 2019, 4,500 churches closed the doors. They died. That's it. The three families here gave up, or the one last family standing said, we're out, we're going to the church down the road. It's over. And less churches actually started, 3,000. Now, that's pre-pandemic. You can imagine now, when it comes out again this year, it's going to be more than double in the size of churches that are closing their doors versus new church plants. Let me show you one more. Here's part of that reason why. Why could a church die? Church membership among U.S. adults, now below 50%. Do you realize from 1940s all the way to about 2000, 70% or more people would say we regularly attend a church. My family is tied to that church, any kind of church. But 2000 on, that's been declining, and it's declining faster and faster every year. And pretty soon, we're already in the minority, people. If you're here this morning, you're going to be a very small minority in the U.S. of people that say we attend church on a regular basis. So why in the world would church die? Listen, if you don't replace yourself as a church, if there's nobody younger than you going to your church, just give it a few years, it will die. Matter of fact, let me ask you a couple more questions on that topic. So what do you think the average church size in the U.S. is today? What do you think? Somebody just shout it out. What do you think? Average church size. 150, 150, hundreds. We are a church of about a 1,000. We have our third service, the CEE. We have a lot of kids in preschool and children that don't always come over here. But on a weekend, we have about a 1,000. And we are not your average church size because the average church size is going to be 75 people. 75 people. Now, there's thousands of churches, right? I mean, I grew up in a little bitty town called Fairfax, and we had about 15 churches as a kid. But today, you're lucky if there's about three or four that are still there. Two of my high school buddies actually pastor two of those churches. What about the percentage of declining churches? What percentage do you think of churches in the U.S. are actually going down, going backwards, as opposed to growing? What percentage do you think? 65, 70, 30. Answer is 80. That means 80% of all churches in the U.S. are shrinking. They're declining. They're not growing. People, we won't be here long. I keep telling you we're in the minority. We think we're not, but we are heading there really, really fast. How about two more questions? Let's see this. The median age of the U.S. If you took everybody who lived in the U.S. from birth to 125, whatever the oldest person is, what's the median number? What's that middle number? What do you think it is? 20s? Man, that's young. 30s? Answer is... It's 39. That still sounds pretty young to us. So now the question really hits home is, well, uh, what about the church? What about people going to church? What's the average age, the median age of people attending churches? What do you think? Yeah, let's just say it ain't going to be below 39, right? The answer is 50 to 60, depending on the denomination that took the survey. Now, what does that tell you? If you're an older person, I'm 53, getting up there. If you're an older person and you're in a church and you don't replace yourself with younger people, in about 20, 25 years, we're going to be gone, right? And there's nobody behind us. That church will die, all right? You don't have to get rock and roll on the stage to kill a church. You just don't change. You don't do anything different. You don't reach new people. Give it a couple of decades. That church will die. Listen, when we have hundreds of students in here sitting for D now, you better celebrate we have children's ministry, and there's 250 people playing upward basketball. You better rejoice. People, we have to reach younger people, or we're going to die, and there'll be nobody behind us. It happens even in Tallahassee. We have seen that firsthand where churches come say, here's the keys to the building. 
There's nobody left. The church of Sardis, Christ called it a dead church. They had some people left, but they were dead because they had lost their first love, right? They had lost worshiping the one true God. Now, let's reread that text. And this time as we read that text, I want to point out a few things that hopefully will speak to us as a church, but more importantly to you as an individual. God, I know I may look like I'm a believer. I put on my Sunday clothes and I say I'm fine just like everybody else can. But on the inside, am I living for Christ or am I just flat out dead, just waiting for the corpse to fall over? Let's look at the letter again. So let me highlight a few things. First of all, it says these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God. What in the world? Seven spirits? I thought there was one Holy Spirit. What are the seven spirits of God? Well, we got to go back to the Old Testament, back in Isaiah. Kind of explains this a little bit better. Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3 says this. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. So Jesse, Obed had Jesse. Jesse had David. From David, we're going to get all the way down to King Jesus is coming through his line. On King Jesus will come the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That spirit will have wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, will have knowledge, fear, and piety. That's seven. It basically means the spirit is in fullness. It's complete. That is the spirit that has to live inside a church or a church will die. So as we worship, God sends his spirit to help us worship him, to give us knowledge as we teach, to lead us, to make our decisions The Holy Spirit says, I am full and I am complete. We need these things in our church or we will die. Let me ask you another question. What are the four scariest words in the Bible? Think about what we're saying. The four scariest words. You don't have to answer. Four scariest words in the Bible. I believe you find right here in this verse. It says this, I know your deeds. Now listen, if that doesn't scare you, then you haven't thought about it long enough. Holy and perfect God knows everything you've ever done, everything you've ever thought. And one day, we can talk about Sardis all we want, but one day it'll be your turn to stand before God. And let me, are your knees kind of shaking when you stand before holy God and thinking, this guy, this God knows everything I've ever thought in my life. Man, if you're not fearful, you should be. And the only reason we can have any hope is because we've been forgiven by Jesus Christ himself. So when Jesus died on that cross and his blood was shed, he did that to cover our sins. The only reason we can have hope when we take our turn standing there because our deeds, he says he's literally forgotten them. He has forgiven us of our sin. That's the only hope that we have. A few more things I want to point out from this letter. On the next set of verses, he tells them to strengthen what remains. Listen, man, if your church is doing anything good, do more of it. Do more of it. Strengthen those things that are healthy and good. Strengthen what remains. He tells them to remember. Remember why you're a church at all. What do you exist for? We don't come together to have a good time. Sure, the block parties and the car shows and those big events we have, those are fun, but why are we here? We are here to do what? We're here to do the next one when he says the word repent. We are here to tell people to repent of their sins. Come to know Christ before it's too late. He's telling this church and us to wake up, people. The church is dying. Literally, in our country, the church is dying and people could care less. If we don't wake up and plant churches, who else is? So now I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me, right? I see the body. I see a piece of paper that maybe says you got baptized or maybe you're a Christian. But where is the evidence of that? Where is the fruit that says, God, I so love you that I want other people to love you too. I want to be a part of building up other churches. And you have opportunity. Part of our vision, you know, is that 40 for 40, right? 40 churches planted and 40 people sent into missions. Those are things that are breathing life into dead churches right here in Tallahassee. You don't even have to travel that far. So he has asked us to please wake up and realize that the church is dying on our watch. Didn't happen a couple thousand years ago, right? Sardis, no, he's talking about right now. It's still happening today, and what are we going to do about it? Then he wraps up these last couple of verses. He says this. He says, there are a few people, there's a few in that church who still love me, who are trying to follow me, who are worshiping. There's a few, not many. There's just a few. And he says, this is what they're doing. 
He says, they will be dressed in white. Doesn't matter if you go to that pagan Artemis church, if you go to the church of Sardis, people are wearing their best, right? They put on their robes and they go. If you go to the wrong place, they're going to do things like sacrifice, you know, even people and children. And you're going to partake in things that will soil your garment. And when you come out, you can literally see the sin that's clinging to your outfit. And what he says about his people is, his people will be dressed in white. Not because of the good things you've done, because of the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I give you a new robe. You'll be dressed in white when you stand before my Father because of what I have done, not because of what we ourselves can do on our own. We will be dressed in white. Then he ends the letter with this. He talks about this book of life. What in the world is this book of life? Several times in the New Testament, it's described as the, as the Lamb's book of life. Listen, when you come to know Jesus Christ, he literally writes your name in a book called Book of Life. If your name is in that book, it cannot be blotted out. You are his. John 10, 29 is a great reminder that says, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. In other words, once you are a believer in Christ, you are born again, you are, quote, saved, whatever you want to say, you belong to God for eternity. You cannot lose that. If you have that and that's a real relationship with him, it's his job to keep us right. He will do his part. It says we can't even jump out because we belong to him. And your name is in that book of life for eternity. Then he says this. He says, please, whoever has ears, would you please listen up? Would you please listen? Man, if you've got ears, let them hear. Listen, man, your life, it's like that. It is quick and it's over. I know right now we're enjoying it and it feels kind of slow depending on your age. But the older you get, you understand the faster it goes. And this is the time to wake up and say, God, if you're speaking to me, please, let me hear you. I would love nothing more to be part of a living church of Jesus Christ that cares about the gospel in our community. So the letter that was written to Sardis is a letter that's also written to us. And if you walk through these four C's, ask yourself these questions. Number one, the Christ. What is Jesus saying to you? Hey, man, I want you to be a part of my ministry. I want you to be a part of helping other churches. I want you to lead in the church you're in. He is speaking to you. It is time, he says, to follow Christ. Talking to the church. What about us? I love the name celebration. I pray, I pray that we don't lose the name celebration. I pray that every week it is a celebration when the people of God, not the building, but the people come together and we worship God and we celebrate changed lives and what he's done in our community. Because here's the deal. He's going to ask in this church to change. And if he asks us to change, I pray that we're in tune with him, that, God, if there's something in our church that's creeping in, let's cut that off. Let's do our best to follow and worship the one true God. Whatever is going to bring people to Christ and help us worship, let us be about those things. Because the second coming is coming. He is coming back. I know you may not think that. You may not think about it all the time. But he is coming back one day, and every person, church, everybody on this planet We'll take their turn standing before God. And remember, he knows every deed that we have ever done. So hopefully these letters as we walk through them will make us think about, God, what about me? What are you asking me to do today? Well, here's my homework then. These three things is what I'm asking you to think about as you leave the room today. First of all, I want you to remember. He asked them to remember. Remember why we're here. We are not here to have a good time. Now, we will have a good time if we worship God. But that's not the main reason we come. We're here to remember that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins for everybody. And we need to invite people to come and accept that invitation. Remember why we are here. The gospel, the good news of Christ is why we are here. That is why we are church. That is why we come together. Secondly, he says, I want you to say out loud the word repent. Say repent. repent. It's almost a bad word to some people. Repent. Wait a minute. That means I've done something wrong. If I say the word repent, well, guess what? You have done something wrong. You have sinned against a holy and perfect God. And any sin against him, we have to repent. We're not asking people to come and just join the fellowship and say, my bad. Okay, I did a couple. No, we're asking people to repent. That means turn around and go the other way and worship God only. Maybe a bad word in our community, but it's a word that he says to the letters of the churches, I want you to repent of what you've done. I want you to remember. I want you to repent. And lastly, people, it is time to wake up. Say wake up. Wake up. I'm serious. If the church doesn't wake up, we might be here in 50 years and the church might be for sale. 
because we didn't replace ourselves. We didn't grow as a church. We didn't invest in students and children in the next generation. And one day, just like a church literally down the road has closed the doors, says we're done, that could be us. Now, I told you I would tell you that other story. I want to close with a story about the city of Sardis. I told you about the first story where the soldier lost his helmet, and that's how the Persians came in and conquered the city. The second one's even weirder. The second time it was captured by Antiochus on the Greeks, when the soldiers that are camped out down here at the bottom, they're looking up saying, how are we going to get up there? You know, they didn't, couldn't Google and said, well, how did the Persians do it, you know? They, they couldn't get to that story. But literally, the soldiers are looking up, and they see part of the cliffs, and they look up, and there's dozens and dozens and hundreds of birds. And there's just birds literally perched on the edge of the cliff and on the walls, and they get to thinking, now listen, if all those birds are there, that means there's nobody there. I mean, if there were soldiers there and people walking around, those birds wouldn't be sitting on those walls like that. And said, let's go investigate. So a few of those soldiers from that army climbed up there again and climbed those cliffs and got up. And sure enough, there was nobody even there defending that part of the city. Those soldiers went back, got some of their buddies. They came up. And just like the first time, enough of them got out there without being detected. They burned the city to the ground and leveled it and destroyed it. Now, I tell you that because I think it applies to us. I think just like that church died, I think that could happen to us. And it doesn't happen with some gigantic sins that just come from everywhere. It happens with a little bitty crack in the armor, a little habit, a little something that we say we're okay with that we allow into our church, and it begins to kind of widen that gap. And before we know it, that little sin that you thought you had under control, that you thought you could handle, turns into be your downfall. And when we give Satan a foothold, Man, he wants more than just the foot, people. He wants every inch of your body, of your character, of your witness. And he can destroy you if we just don't defend one little part of who we are. So my prayer for our church and for us today, that we will remember why we're here, we'll repent, ask other people to repent, and we will wake up because the enemy is attacking from everything, on everything you can imagine he's coming at us. And we got to defend every part and say, no, this is going to be the church that says we love you, Jesus Christ. We're imperfect people. Your leaders aren't perfect by far, but we love Jesus Christ, and we want to worship his name only. We want to come together, and we want to see more people come and worship that one and only true God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the goodness of your word, how a letter that was literally written a few thousand years ago still applies to us today. God, I thank you that our church, I pray that we'll always be willing to stand up and worship with our heart, to teach the word, God, to ask other people to repent, to come to know Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. That is why we're here. So while we may have a calendar full of stuff, I pray that every year, Lord, weekly basis, we take time to say, okay, God, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Remember why we are here. Let's repent of our sins. Let's say we're sorry ask you to forgive us and let's worship you and father it is definitely time for us and churches across our city our state our nation to wake up churches are dying left and right we don't want to be part of that number part of that stat we want to be a church that sees more people our children our grandchildren we want to see them come to know christ and the people around us so father that's what we ask that we take these letters we take these warnings to heart make them personal And God, that we are inspired, encouraged, we are motivated to go out and live a life of Christ because it does matter. My life counts. It'll be over soon. When we look back and we stand before you, I don't want to be ashamed of the time that maybe we wasted. So help us to worship you on a weekly basis, to love you daily with our lives, and to serve you with everything that we have. Lord, you also say that if anybody has ears, let them hear. Maybe there's somebody today who needs Jesus. They don't have that relationship. Maybe they understand that they are a sinner. They have made mistakes against a holy and perfect God. And there's nothing they can do about it. But Jesus, when you died on that cross, you said that's for everybody. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Father, I'm thankful that we can come to you for forgiveness. And I pray that today is the day if somebody's here who can hear my voice, says, you know, that's me. Right outside the door is a little tent called Fresh Start. I pray they will go there, talk to someone about what it means to come to know Christ or be a part of our church, or any questions they might have. So, Father, as we leave here, we're going to stand, we're going to worship. Father, I pray that we worship with all our heart. I pray we realize time is 
clicking. It is ticking. And this is our church and our time. We do not want to be a dead church. So I pray that we stand up, we sing, we love you. And God, we go live a life that brings you honor. And we care about the people around us. So Father, we ask and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said? Amen.